Right, we're back for another episode of Plastic Weekly, and uh, this time around, I'm joined by an old acquaintance from from way back, uh, Keegan Minnick from Colorado, uh, root setter, freelance hold shaper, and if you watch this channel, it wouldn't be surprising if you've seen his YouTube channel uh, called Dojo Setting, where he uh, is explaining root setting concepts to new setters or other setters in general. It's a really cool channel. Take a look at it. Um, the reason we're talking, like I, I was kind of telling Keenan earlier that, you know, we met back in the day and I've had this idea to, to spend some time revisiting uh, people that I had met in climbing, you know, up to a decade ago and see what they were up to. But then on Facebook in the in the Root Setters Anonymous channel, there was this conversation where some young guy, I think from Australia, posted a comment saying like, hey, I'm a novice root setter. Does anybody have any resources for me to, you know, learn how to set certain moves or get inspiration for root setting? And some of the answers are like decent. And some of the answers just made me really frustrated about where root setting education is as a whole. Like some of the good answers were, hey, take a look at uh, Keegan's channel where he he teaches these concepts or, you know, uh, uh, spend some time on a, on a spray wall and, and try and make up moves. And then there were terrible answers like by Jackie Godoff's book on root setting, which is really like a book of poetry for for advanced World Cup root setters. It doesn't teach you how to root set. Right. Um, or just what was the other one? Just like uh, spend a lot of time. Anyway, some frustrating answers for for people that are trying to get into root setting. These just like are not practical answers. And it really showcases how few resources our industry is built up to teach people how to do this job. So anyway, Keegan, thanks for taking time in what sounds like a, a, a busy day for you. You're on the clock. So I, <laughs> I appreciate you totally ditching your job to chat for a bit. Oh, absolutely, man. Anytime. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, no worries. So, well, just to, to, to clear it up, uh, we met in 2013 at a, a USA climbing, uh, level one root setting clinic in Boston. Um, and aside from, I had been setting at that point for, I guess, like maybe a year and a half or whatever. I had actually, I was no longer a full-time root setter at that point. I had moved into like a management position in the gym. So my gym covered like half of me going and I covered the other half. I really just wanted to like learn what was going on and see what the, what the education program was like. And my memories of that clinic were, it was cool getting to meet lots of people like you. That was awesome. It was nice to get FaceTime with people like Danielson and in our case, uh, like Dave Wetmore and Ian McIntosh. That was really awesome. It was fun getting to spend time in a couple facilities that I'd never seen before. And we got to work in some different uh, Metro Rock uh, facilities, but I didn't come away with it feeling like I knew a lot more about practical root setting. I felt like I knew how to make um, root setters better than me happy if I would ever work with them, but I didn't feel like I came away learning how to set moves better or, or how to have a better approach to root setting in general. Um, so my first question for you is like, when you got into the, into the USA setting stream, how did those educational opportunities, uh, leave you feeling like, did those feel productive for you? And if so, like in what way? Uh, well, the level one clinic that you and I were both at at that point, I think I had been setting for five years or so, uh, somewhere in there. So I really viewed it as just sort of getting my foot in the door, starting to go through the motions. Um, I was a youth competitor growing up and, um, you know, we had sort of like idealized the root setters. They were, you know, they were the, the wizards that created all the magic, you know? So, and I thought it would be really cool. It's like, I want to do that. Um, so for me, the level one clinic was just sort of getting my foot in the door. Um, I don't necessarily think, that it was structured to be something that was, this is how you set. Um, I think a lot of it was more structured on how to work in a crew. Uh, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, I, I felt that it was a really good networking opportunity. It was a really good, uh, opportunity to, uh, sort of what, what you were saying, explore a different gym, work with new people, uh, things like that. But I, I would agree in terms of like, hey, this is how you set. I, I don't think the curriculum was necessary, necessarily geared towards that. The, um, the, the moment in the clinic that that really like exposed would, um, like a frustration for me was the last task they had us do. Um, and it was I think we all like drew a uh, drew a move out of a hat. 
It was something like that. Um, and I had to set a barn door. Uh, I had to force a barn door. I, I'm, I don't know if you remember what, what you had to set. But I remember at the time knowing I knew what a barn door felt like. Um, I know I know what it feels like when you're climbing to, to be put in a barn door. But on the wall that I had and with the holds I had, I couldn't make it work. And to be honest, that was the first time I had ever consciously tried to set a barn door and maybe one of the first few times that I had ever gone into setting a problem trying to set a particular move and maybe the purpose of that exercise was more of a test to see like hey do these guys have the practical skills to to force moves but it it knocked something in my head that made me realize like hey in all of my root setting experience at that point honestly only for a couple of years um, it made me realize I'd never really approached root setting as trying to set particular moves. Uh, it had always been like, what holds do I have? And I'm going to set a path to the top. Um, how did you interpret that exercise? I don't know if, if, if you feel like you had a different approach to root setting at the time than I did. Uh, for me, it was, I would agree. It was a test. Um, you know, you hear about these people, you know, Dave Wetmore, Ian McIntosh, obviously Chris Danielson, and there, I, I think mine was a paddle jump. Um, I had to do a paddle. Yeah, you had the red up. technic, whatever. I was very, because yeah. we were sitting very close to each other. And I was like, yo, that problem looks sick. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it was one of those things where I was just like, oh man, these are people that like I look up to and like they want to see if I can play the game, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really nerve wracking for me. You know, maybe that wasn't the point they were trying to get across, but I was I definitely took it as like, they want to know if I can play ball, if I can do this. So, um, I, maybe I did. I, I'm not sure. I, I think Dave Wetmore ended up hap, uh, helping me with it a lot. Um, right. I think we got it ended up working, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, that's kind of how I viewed the exercises. They, they want to know what you can do. Right. So, all right. So, so anyway, that's how we met. And, that's just some some reflection on, on what that program was, which I, I think I agree. Like, it's not really meant to be an educational opportunity for new root setters. Like, none of the people that were there were new root setters. We were all, all like, experienced to some degree. Um, yeah. So let's talk about how you started setting. Like, at that point, you had already been climbing as a competitor for a bit. Um, but what I'm curious about is, like, whoever hired you or whoever your boss was, what kind of training did you get as a root setter? Because my training was, this is how you don't cross a T-nut right? This is like how you make sure that the bolts are always the right length, depending on what wall you're on. Cause the gym I sit at had like different T nut depths. And then after that, it was like, now set a thing to the top. And when it's done, I'm going to come and forerun it. And I might tell you to like turn some shit. So what was your root setting education? Like, um, less than that, <laughs> uh, less than that. I, I started my root setting at uh, I don't think it's an international company. It's it's called Lifetime Fitness. It's essentially yeah, they, a glorified they have rec Canada, center. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I I was climbing at Lifetime Fitness because it was just like two miles from my house. It was the closest place that I could go to climb, and was out climbing everything. You know, that was I was getting bored, and I I think I turned sixteen or seventeen somewhere in there, and they're like, hey, do you want to work here and like set climbs for us, like? you know what you're doing, right? You, you climb hard. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so, but to them that didn't matter. Um, so I just, I was the strong climber, so I would know how to set routes. So they, uh, this is before drills. They gave me a T handle wrench and said, all right, here are all the bolts. Here are all the holds. Do your thing. Um, so it was a lot of self-taught. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of instruction that I was given. I, I wasn't even given you know, this is the proper bolt length. This is, you know, how to not cross thread something. I just, I had to figure those things out on my own, uh, which was kind of a blessing and a curse. You know, it, it wasn't the quickest way to learn things. You know, you had to sort of learn the hard way on, yeah, this is cross threaded. Mm -hmm. Now I have a big problem. I got to fix this. It might, um, might've been a blessing or a curse for you, but it was definitely a curse for the wall. Like that wall's probably got some, <laughs> some shit T nuts now, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. Um, but it was kind of cool because like, I don't want to sound like I'm trash talking lifetime fitness, but I mean, it's not a climbing gym, you yeah. know? So like, you're not going to have members that are upset that you set a bad five ten or set a super sandbag V three. Like it, it was almost 
I could do whatever I wanted to do and it didn't matter because nobody climbing there was like a dedicated climber. Um, so I could mess up all I wanted to. I could go through the learning process without having, you know, a, a member base of climbers getting mad about what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was kind of nice in that respect. You know, I could play around with moves. I could, uh, you know, try to get crazy ideas to work, uh, with the resources that I had. And, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of repercussions. I, you know, I did my thing and nobody else really had anything to say about it. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. What resources would you look out for at that time if you were like trying to set stuff? Like, I mean, as a competitor, I'm sure you had a ton of different problems in your head where you're like, oh, I want to set this or that. But were there, like aside, yeah. from, aside from Louis's like art of course setting, was there anything, even if, if that, that you could get your hands on or like videos or anything? I don't know what year this was. So. Um. So yeah, yeah, I got you. This was probably back in 2007 around there. Um, essentially YouTube, uh, YouTube. I watched a lot of videos of competitions, uh, me living in Colorado, there were a ton of competitions going on. So I'd go to as many comps as I could afford to go to, you know, when I was in high school and just pay attention to the roots. You know, I'd, I'd try to look up, I think I, googled crazy climbing moves uh, more than once and uh you know saw these videos i was like oh that looks cool let me see if i can make that work on my wall Um, and most of the time it didn't work but uh you know that's ultimately what it was there weren't really a whole lot of resources that i knew of at least that was like hey if you're trying to get this move to happen this is what you need to consider these are the things that you need to do to entice a climber to do that um, so it was a lot of trial and error. It was sort of monkey see, monkey try to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so right, okay. So yeah. let me let me uh, let me kind of like pause it. The the thing that's been in my head for for the last like I guess it's been maybe about a year. Um, and this is and I know Tande hates the the like root setters are the chef of the of the gym metaphor but I love I love the idea of taking a metaphor and trying to just drag it out beyond its logical conclusion like take it as far as you can go because they can be like really good tools for for analyzing what you do and like as a learning process and and the one that i have have really enjoyed thinking about especially since covid started and before that just as a as a gym manager you know one thing we always get is people wanting to learn how to set you know people people have gotten to the point they don't even ask to be root setters anymore because they know they can't like they know nobody's hiring (laughs) we don't give a shit like we know it's a dope looking job you're not going to get a job in root setting like it's it's already over but people really want to learn how to root set they want to get their hands in it they want to like you know give themselves a chance to maybe one day do some root setting and some gyms try to do programming around that um i know some local gyms in toronto have have made some opportunities where a select group of members can get on a very particular wall with supervision from the head root setter and and kind of figure it out and i really like those those innovations but the the parallel i keep coming back to is uh is the chef metaphor which is for the you know however many super elite chefs there are in the world there are 7 billion people on planet earth that cook, right? Even if that's people like me who can like barely cook a bowl of cereal, all of us cook (laughs) to some extent. And that means that, you know, out of the 7 billion of us, we have all kind of been the feeder system for those ultimate top tier chefs that are, are legendary and are pushing boundaries and are creating like the best food to ever exist. Right. And if you try and make a parallel in root setting, there's a few there's a few broken points in the ladder, but um, you know root setting is held back by how small our feeder pool is, right? Like we're a very self selecting industry. You don't become a root setter unless you've been chosen by another root setter. It's almost impossible to showcase your skill as a root setter without having been selected as a root setter already, right? Like how many times do you hire somebody that has setting experience? Nowadays, it's more than in the past, but it's typically like, oh yeah, that's the strong guy at the gym. And it's like almost always a guy, unfortunately, that's reality right now. Um, But it's almost always, you just like, who's the kid at the gym that always shows up and looks interested? I'm going to declare he's a root setter now, and now I'll teach him how to be a root setter. So it's not like we have this really big pool of people that have been developing skills at home and then can come into the job with a, with a base. And without having that really big feeder pool, it kind of dilutes how, how good the rest of the industry can be. Um, 
where where my parallel breaks with being a chef is you and I both have a kitchen, right? If we want to cook, we have the facilities at home to help us cook. Whereas in root setting, that doesn't exist so much. Um, we don't all have a home wall. But when the pandemic came along, suddenly there's an explosion of home walls. And it's all of these people all of a sudden building a wall for the first time, drilling T-nut holes for the first time, buying holds and having to set moves for the first time. And all of a sudden, even though it's not like, you know, it's it's not every climber in North America, suddenly there's like an explosion of home walls. And that base of people that are having to use a T-wrench has grown a ton. And now the the part that people are now asking for is those people who have now built a kitchen for themselves, a kitchen of root setting. Now they're asking for a cookbook and root setting is now at least 30 years old and there is not a cookbook yet for root setting. And that's where I find the videos that you're doing on YouTube to be really interesting because they're the closest thing that I've seen <laughs> so far to somebody saying, this is what an omelet is. This is how you make an omelet. And these are the things you can and can't do. Otherwise, it's something else, right? Like, you know, when you were when you were learning root setting, you would see a video of a move. And that's like somebody showing you a picture of an omelet. And then you have to figure out what the ingredients are. And you have to figure out what temperature and what pan to cook it in. Whereas you're saying like, hey, we're going to set a tow hook. We're going to do it on this angle. And that means I can do this and this. I need the holds to be about this. I need to consider these distances. And that's the first time I'm seeing somebody practically talk about root setting that way. And that's been really, really cool for me. So let's talk a little bit about your videos. Like when you are trying to explain to people how to do a particular move, you've clearly put some thought into like what people need to know. So how do you outline that in your head when you go to be like, okay, I'm going to teach a figure four. What do people really need to know about this? Yeah, um, it's it's been a really actually interesting process because you know, after you set for a while, you just kind of know how to do things, right? Like as, as you set more and more often, you start realizing, oh, the foot needs to be here to make this work. And you stop thinking about those. You sort of go on to autopilot. Uh, so these videos have been really helpful um, by forcing me to actually think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, a lot of the times it's just like, well, I want the figure four to work. Um, so I'm going to throw holds on the wall and hopefully make it work. Uh, with these videos, I'm taking a deeper look into why, you know, into why does this work or why does this not work? Uh, what I've found more times than not, uh, and it almost sort of goes back to that level one clinic, the orientation of the hold, you know, if you just turn it a little bit more clockwise, this works. Um, but if it's not clockwise, it doesn't work because they can do this. Um, uh, so a lot of it comes from me watching a lot of climbers and when they cheat the move, it's like, okay, well, why did they cheat the move? What about my, my dish? What about my entree? Uh, did they not get, you know, was, was the foot too high? Was the hold too whatever? Um, so, you know, thinking about all those specific moves, okay, this is how I've seen people cheat it. So we're going to focus on those things. You know, we, we cheat the hand heel match because we can step through with our feet instead of, you know, bringing your foot up. So we're going to focus on where that foothold goes so that they can't step through. Um, if, if that makes any sort of sense. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And I think so. like what, what's, what's curious for me is like, I would have, first of all, I would have enjoyed root setting a lot more. I would have been a more useful employee right away if I had had those kinds of lessons. And I think what, you know, first of all, if, if you're a, a head root setter, your time is taken up by a lot of things, but most of your job is, is training other root setters. And I find that sometimes it's not particularly direct or focused on helping people learn how to create specific movements. A lot of the time I find from my personal experience and the root setting I've witnessed over time is people put up a problem and then it comes about, okay, let's bring it to this grade or let's make sure it flows properly. But it's not as often about, oh, you were trying to create this type of move. Let's really dig into this and, and, and make this movement work. Um, so that's, that's something I wish in my experience I had had. And that's why 
if I had videos like the ones you've had, I think back to like the first couple of boulder problems I set where I was just like lost in a holds room thing of like, what am I supposed to do? And everything kind of like at first it all started out just looking like ladders. And I like to think that if I had been able to watch a video where it's like, oh, this is what a tow hooks look like, I'd be able to go into my job and say, oh, I want to set that thing that, uh, that I saw and that I like have a really good understanding of how the mechanics work. So, um, how does uh, the way you're communicating in these videos, do you find like that reflects in the root setting community that, that you've existed in in the past? Like, has there been that kind of reflection and, and um, sharing that kind of knowledge between root setters? Uh, not at first. I, I, I think it's a reflection of what I wish I did have. Um, you know, first starting off, like I said, I was on my own uh, when I got my first job as a commercial climbing gym setter back in when was it 2011 i think um they same same thing they were just kind of like okay you know what you're doing here you go um it wasn't actually until i started working at the gym that i'm currently at now uh where i had a really really passionate group of route setters all trying to make each other shine hmm. you know i mean a lot of the times, you know, you're on a setting crew and I, I'm going to say you're lying if you've never had this thought, the thought of like, okay, I need to set the coolest thing this week. Sure. Like, I don't care what these other guys are doing. I need to put up the rig that's incredible. Um, and you like, you're just trying to outdo the other guy, you know, so, or girl, um, the other setter. So if you have a group of people who are genuinely interested in making the overall product, not just their own good. It really helps, um, to be able to dive into why does this work or why does this not work? Um, and ultimately it benefits everybody, even as, you know, let's say you're more experienced than everybody else on your crew and you're the one that ends up helping them make movement happen. You're still learning, you know, you're learning as to, you know, being able to articulate why something works or why something doesn't work, or you're able to really explore their thought process as to why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so I think it's beneficial to everybody just to, to have a crew that's just passionate about climbing. That's not necessarily trying to put up the coolest climb in the gym. They're trying to overall raise the level of quality in the gym. I, I think that's a really beneficial thing to have. Are you in a position where you, where you're involved in like hiring root setters or, or like, I don't, I don't know if that's something you have to deal with in your job. Gotcha. Yeah. So, um, I am a jack of all trades at the gym. I am the general manager and I am the head route setter. Cool. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so directly, yes, I, cool. I, you know, anybody who wants to get paid to be at the gym goes through me, regardless if they want to work at the desk or work, uh, as a setter. Right. Um, so I, in this, sorry, go ahead. I, I get, my question is, is basically like, you know, the things that, that I have seen root setters look for in their hires are, does this look like somebody that work can work well with us? Because root setting is kind of a, a, a high, high ish stress team-based environment. You've got deadlines, you're trying to put stuff up. You don't want people veering too far out of your philosophy. So you want them to be able to work well with your team. And then often it feels like second to that is what experience do you have? You know, like, are you, are you actually good at this job? Do you have like demonstrable skills? Um, if, if you had somebody come to you and say like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm new to this town, but I've been watching your videos for a bunch. I've been like working on setting like toe hooks, this and that on my home wall. And like, here's some videos of stuff that I've set based on your lessons. If, if you had root setters coming to you that, that have just been working away at a home wall, picking at these skills and they can like prove that, Hey, yeah, I know how, how to set all these moves. Like it, it, I'm surely that becomes more attractive to you as somebody hiring someone for your crew. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're essentially saying, Hey, I don't need as much training as somebody who's never done this before. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I would agree that, you know, first and foremost, you want to make sure that you have somebody who's going to work well uh, with the rest of your crew that, um, you know, is easy to get along with. Uh, me personally, I 
don't necessarily care if you have setting experience or not. Um, I want to know what your climbing experience looks like. And the reason being, I, <laughs> I don't know when this is going to air, but I actually have a video today uh, that I'm going to be releasing that is talking about the difference between a strong climber and a good climber. And I want the good climber to be on the setting crew. I don't necessarily actively seek out the strong person. Mm. Um, I, I know a lot of strong climbers that don't know what they're doing. Um, and that's not meant to be an insult. I mean, they pull really hard and they, you know, they get to the top of whatever V10, V11, but it's like, well, Hey, why, like, how did you do that? Why, why did you think of that beta? And they're like, I don't know. Right. I, I want somebody who is just like, you know what? I'm like, I'm specifically doing this for this reason. And this is, you know, a lot of it comes down to technique, but you know, having somebody who genuinely understands movement, um, one of the best setters that we have ever hired didn't have any setting experience. Uh, he was really, really well, he was, he was a unicorn. He was a really strong climber, but he was a really good climber. Um, and he was one of the best people that I've ever worked with. Um, I, I don't think he's setting anymore, but uh, phenomenal. You know, we've had some people, uh, we've, we've had some bigger name people in the route setting world work at our gym. And I'm not, I'm not going to name any names, but honestly, a couple, I was unimpressed. It's like, dude, you're, you don't necessarily understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so I think, finding the good climbers, not necessarily the strong climbers is what I'm looking to do. Um, yes. Seeing those, tying it back to your question, seeing your, uh, you know, your videos online has helped me and here's my portfolio of stuff I've set on my home wall. It definitely helps, um, you know, because you're starting to understand why these movements happen. And that's the hardest part about route setting is understanding why. Um, so I don't know if that <laughs> kind of well, answers your question. Let's all, I want, I want to wrap this up for you because we're already like kind of over time, but um, uh, what's, who are the people that are, are kind of like watching your videos, like based on who's commenting and things like that, who's watching, what are they asking for? Like, are, do you find it is mostly home wall people or are you getting any evidence that there's like hired paid root setters that are, are kind of using <laughs> your videos for, for like self-training sort of? Um, I would, I would argue for the most part, I think it's home wall users. Right. Um, humorously enough, we, my gym has another location about an hour North of this location and the head setter there texts me all the time. He's like, yo man, I make, I make our setters watch your videos. I'm like, <laughs> that's awesome. Why? Like, that's great. But why, why are, why aren't we just doing this? Like, why aren't you doing this on a day to day basis? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's, it's home wall people. Um, I've had a few people reach out and say, Hey, I've been setting on my home wall and I'm trying to transition into commercial setting. You know, do you have any insight on how that transition works? Uh, and that's been great. Um, you know, I, I really hope those people have been <laughs> pursuing that if that's mm -hmm. what they want to pursue. Um, it's, it was kind of going back to what were they asking for? Uh, it was very interesting because I, you know, as a setter, I'm, you know, the Houdini is really crazy. You know, the paddle dinos are really cool, all these wild moves. So when people started asking for like, Hey, how do you set a heel hook? Yeah. Uh, my, my first, and I, I've gotten away from this. This isn't meant to sound bad to anybody. My first thought was like, man, I don't want to do a video about that. You just put the hold on and put your heel on. It's uh -huh. easy. <laughs> but then as I was thinking about it, it's like, well, no, it's not. You know, when I was first starting to set, that was top level stuff. I couldn't figure out how to make somebody put their heel on a hold instead of just towing in on something. Yeah. Um, so it was, it sort of re-sparked the, uh, you know, the, the initial, how does this happen? You know, the cool moves, the really amazing show pleasing moves are, are cool. Um, but ultimately the people that are probably watching these, 
need the very fundamental things, heel hooks, toe hooks, um, you know, hand foot matches was another one. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I'm like, man, that's basic. I don't want to talk about that, but it's like, well, that's important because that's how you start. That's that, you know, those are the building blocks to all these other ridiculous, crazy, cool stuff that you see. So you need to have that foundation. So yeah, man, no, it's, it, it's been more fun to do the, the more basic moves cool um lately I've, I've been enjoying those yeah that's awesome let's leave it there i just like I, I i hopefully we'll talk again at some point just to talk maybe about like just reflect on on our careers and how climbing has gone in the in the time since we last got to uh uh briefly work together but until then i just want to say i really appreciate the videos you're doing i wish they were around when i had started setting <laughs> because just for for the way i learn and the way i think about root setting it was something that was unaddressed in my training and i know for sure all of those people that are just, you know, they, they dream about their climbs at their gym and they really want to be a part of that. I think it's a really important tool. And I, I do believe you are raising the floor on root setting and that efforts like what you're doing are going to be responsible for root setting going to the next level. So I hope you keep doing it and I hope you're setting a really good model for other experienced root setters and how they communicate stuff. So keep, keep it up with the channel. And of course, if you're watching this video, make sure you check out his channel too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate all the kind words. You know, I'm just, I'm just doing something that is fun for me to do. I'm, I'm glad other people are getting things out of it. So cool, man. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel. And of course, visit uh, uh, Keegan's channel over at Dojo Setting. Uh, of course, you can support this channel uh, by following on all the different socials, but you can also donate on Patreon where I can get you stickers and all that kind of stuff. Um, definitely spend your money on my Patreon, not on Keegan's if he has one. I don't know if he does. <laughs> or you can split it halfway, no. whatever, whatever. It's all good. Um, otherwise, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks very much for watching.